Up next, the Civil War in Montgomery County. Stay tuned. Welcome to Paths to the Present. I'm Barbara Grunbaum, standing in for Gale Street. Today we conclude the two-part series on Montgomery County during the Civil War. Our story left off with the adoption of the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863. Later that year, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia began a second invasion of the North. Most Confederate troops moved through Virginia and West Virginia, crossing the Potomac north of Montgomery County. However, General Jeb Stuart led his cavalry through Montgomery County, which included a stopover in Rockville. On June 27, 1863, Jeb Stuart led 5,000 Confederate cavalrymen across the Potomac at Rouser's Ford. Their plan was to cut between the Union Army and the city of Washington. The rain-swollen river made crossing difficult, but by 3 a.m. the next morning, they made it without alerting federal troops. One day later, Jeb Stewart and his cavalry rode into Rockville to a boisterous reception. Southern sympathizers in town welcomed the raiders and cheered. But other folks in town had a different take on this parade. John Higgins, a local store owner, and Judge Richard Johns Bowie, both Unionists, hid with some compatriots in the basement of Christ Episcopal Church on North Washington Street. They were hoping to elude capture by Stewart's men who were searching the town, cutting telegraph lines, and stealing horses. Eventually, the men were discovered and taken into custody. They were held, along with other prominent Rockville Unionists, in the courthouse, which was only a block away. While in Rockville, Stewart stayed here, at the home of Charles Prettyman. During that time, a few of his men ventured as far south as Tenleytown in the pursuit of a wagon train of Union supplies. Three days later, General Stewart moved on to Brookville. There, the prisoners were eventually released. Stewart continued on to meet General Lee at Gettysburg. Because of his stopover in Rockville, he arrived two days into that crucial three-day battle. Some historians speculate that if Stewart had not lingered in Rockville, the outcome at Gettysburg might have been very different. During the first three days of July, 1863, Generals Robert E. Lee and George Meade met at the Battle of Gettysburg. Fierce fighting raged on the land surrounding this little Pennsylvania town. In the end, Meade's army held off Lee and his men, ending their invasion of the North. This three-day battle resulted in approximately 51,000 American casualties, the most of any battle in the American Civil War. Also in July of that year, African Americans in Maryland began to be recruited into the Union Army. Slaveholders here objected because they wanted compensation for their property. Loyalists were appeased with $300 per person. When black soldiers discovered their pay was less than their white counterparts, recruitment fell dramatically. In the end, more than 8,700 black men from Maryland enlisted in the six regiments of the U.S. Colored Troops. Even though the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed into law in January of 1863, it didn't change things here in Maryland. Only the states that had seceded from the Union had to comply. That meant plantations run on slave labor could continue in our area. This three-room cabin in Brookville was once a part of William Magruder's plantation. He reportedly owned 19 slaves. Some most likely lived here. After the Civil War, this dwelling continued to be occupied by tenant farmers. Today, it's known as Oakley Cabin African American Museum and Park. On November 13, 1863, a historic speech was delivered. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and... Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address not only honored those who lost their lives in that battle, now but also helped redefine the purpose of the war. In July of 1864, the Confederates attempted a dramatic invasion of Washington, D.C. The capital was at its most vulnerable, 
General Grant had moved south, taking a majority of federal troops with him. Seizing the opportunity, Robert E. Lee dispatched General Jubal Early to attack the city. Their destination was Fort Stevens, just south of the Montgomery County line near Silver Spring. But they made a few stops along the way. On the 9th of July, General Early and 15,000 men clashed with Union General Lew Wallace in the Battle of Monocacy in Frederick County. Greatly outnumbered, Wallace lost the day-long battle, giving the Confederates their only win in the North. Despite that win, the time spent fighting at Monocacy meant Early and his men were delayed for a day, giving the Union time to send reinforcements to Fort Stevens. This encounter later became known as the battle that saved Washington. As they moved on, Early sent Brigadier General John McCausland southward, where his cavalry skirmished with federal troops in Urbana, Durwood, and Cloppers. One of his men is buried here at St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church. Meanwhile, Jubal Early and his men moved southward to Logtown, what we call Gaithersburg today. They camped here on Summit Hill Farm, then owned by John DeSellum, ardent unionist, but also a slave owner. He lived with his sister in the log portion of this home. The DeSellums were forced to entertain the officers who then took advantage of their hosts. This account, written by DeSellum in 1887, describes how Confederate soldiers destroyed his fences and stole his horses, livestock, equipment and seed, save for two bags of corn. It also tells how the DeSellums managed not to lose everything. Two armed men came up and said Early had sent them to search the house for concealed arms. I told Sister privately to run to her room and hide under her dress $3,000 in cash and government bonds. They followed and burst into the room, just as she had concealed the money and bonds under her dress without discovering our subterfuge. With a revolver over us, they ransacked the house. As General Jubal Early continued toward Washington, he directed most of his troops to travel along Veers Mill Road and Georgia Avenue. On the 11th of July, they arrived here, Jessup Blair Park, two miles north of Fort Stevens. This is where the rebels made their camp for the night. The Blairs, a prominent Silver Spring family, had a number of homes here. The one that belonged to Mary Blair is the only one that remains. Her grandfather, Francis Preston Blair, hosted General Early and his officers in his home, which was known as Silver Spring. Early gave orders not to harm that house. But Montgomery Blair, who was Lincoln's postmaster general at the time, wasn't so fortunate. His home, Falklands, was burned to the ground during this raid on Washington. By Tuesday, July 12th, federal troops had arrived at Fort Stevens, ruining Early's plan to surprise the Union. After two days of fighting, the fort was held. President Lincoln was there to observe the encounter. Early left his dead and wounded behind. Years later, 17 bodies were recovered. They were reburied in the cemetery of Grace Episcopal Church in Silver Spring. This monument was erected in 1896 by two local Confederate veterans groups. As Union forces raced to defend the nation's capital from Confederate General Jubal Early's attack on Fort Stevens, other strategic spots were left vulnerable. Taking advantage, Confederates did some damage in the hills overlooking the Potomac. Blockhouse Point Conservation Park gets its name from the blockhouses that served as lookouts for the federal troops who were encamped at Money Branch. For most of the war, there was a Union presence all over this area. They were guarding against rebels crossing the Potomac River into Maryland. In 1862, the 19th Massachusetts Infantry built three blockhouses following the Union defeat at Ball's Bluff. Each was 48 feet square with walls four feet thick and 12 feet high. They offered a secure lookout along the Potomac between Seneca and Great Falls. Two years later, when Union troops stationed here were called away to help defend Fort Stevens, Confederate Colonel John Singleton Mosby and his raiders swooped in and burn the camps along with the three defensive blockhouses. One of those blockhouses stood here on this bluff. Nowadays, you can barely see the river through the trees, but back then, there were no trees, and this gave the soldiers a great view across the river to Virginia. Today, Blockhouse Point Conservation Park 
is one of the few undisturbed Civil War camps in the Washington area, offering a unique opportunity to learn more about life at a small outpost. Three months after Mosby burnt the Union camps and blockhouses along the Potomac, he and some of his men passed through the Quaker village of Sandy Spring. On October 6, 1864, they stopped at the general store located on today's Route 108. Lieutenant Walter Bowie raided the store thinking Quakers would do little to stop him. Store clerk Alvin Gilpin Thomas later wrote these words to his brother. At exactly 12 that night, there was someone on the porch that wanted to go into the store. Upon opening the door, a large man stared at me in the face, and he said if I did not open the door, he would break it down. I then told him to await there until I saw the proprietor of the store. After slipping upstairs and hiding the store money, I awoke Arthur Stabler, Uncle Al, and Joe Davis. We formed behind the store and marched around on them, not knowing their number, and asked what they wanted, but before we knew it, eleven rebs had surrounded us, and to surrender was the only alternative to being shot. They got a little of everything, and a good deal of some things. Just before they left, Arthur Stabler went up to William H. Farquhar's gate, and as they passed, he fired twice. One fellow yelled out, and they hastened their speed. Temporarily setting aside their Quaker beliefs of pacifism, an armed posse of 17 local men pursued Bowie to Durwood. A battle ensued and Bowie was shot and killed in what became known as the Battle of Ricketts Run, named for a nearby creek. Today, that creek runs alongside the Shady Grove Metro Station. A Quaker council meeting in the Sandy Spring Friends Meeting House later disciplined the men who took part in that battle. Later that same month, the citizens of Maryland narrowly approved an amendment to the state's constitution, ending slavery in this state. The amendment took effect on November 1, 1864. By eliminating slavery when it did, Maryland became the first state south of the Mason-Dixon line to free the slaves within its borders by popular vote. The nation didn't know it yet, but as 1864 was coming to a close, so was the war that had torn it apart for nearly four years. Edwards Ferry was the site of the last engagement in the county. Colonel Elijah White and his men skirmished there with the 1st Delaware Cavalry in February 1865. Two months later, Lee surrendered his Army of Northern Virginia on April 9th at Appomattox. Just five days later, the country was rocked at the news that President Lincoln had been shot at Ford's Theater in Washington. Montgomery County became involved when one of the conspirators, George Atzerott, was captured at his relative's farm in Germantown. While the farmhouse is no longer standing, it was located here, near Richter Farm Road, in a recently developed part of Germantown. Because Montgomery County residents were divided in their loyalties, there were those who remained sympathetic with the Southern cause, long after the war ended. On June 3, 1913, this bronze statue was erected in front of the courthouse in Rockville. During 1970's urban renewal, public outcry called for its removal, citing racism. But instead, it was moved to this less conspicuous location next to the 1891 Red Brick Courthouse. The Civil War remains the deadliest war in the history of the United States. For four long years, Americans fought Americans, struggling to define the meaning of freedom for this country. Like every place touched by this grim conflict, the Civil War took its toll on Montgomery County. Reconstruction, the period of adjustment that followed, yielded only a few real advances for African Americans. While the Constitution now afforded certain rights to people of color, Another hundred years would have to pass before they began to see some benefit from the economic, civil, educational, and political freedoms envisioned at the end of the American Civil War. Well, that concludes our look at Montgomery County during the Civil War. I'm Barbara Grunbaum. Thanks for watching.